So friends, Donald Trump may not know it, or he may know it and just be unwilling to acknowledge it, but he is already disqualified from holding federal office again. Let's talk about that, because justice matters. Hey all, Glenn Kirshner here. So friends, you no doubt have been hearing a lot about Section 3 of the 14th Amendment, the Disqualification Clause. Constitutional scholars, professors, academics, from the left and from the right, Republicans and Democrats, conservatives and liberals, have been lining up behind one unified position that Donald Trump is already disqualified from holding federal office again, from serving another term as president. So friends, let me state this as plainly and directly as I can based on the 14th Amendment. No person shall be president of the United States if that person previously took an oath to support the Constitution of the United States, but who thereafter engaged in insurrection or rebellion against the United States or gave aid and comfort to those who did. If you are that person, and Donald Trump is, you are disqualified from holding office in the future. And friends, there are other disqualifications not unlike that disqualification that can be found in the Constitution. For example, the U.S. Constitution states that the president must be a natural born citizen of the United States, be at least 35 years old, and must have been a resident of the United States for 14 years. Friends, there are so many constitutional scholars who are lining up behind this position, this interpretation of the Constitution. There is retired federal judge and lifelong conservative Michael Ludig. There is Harvard Law professor, constitutional scholar, and lifelong Democrat Lawrence Tribe. There are two conservative law professors who recently authored a lengthy law review article on this subject. Professor William Bowd of the University of Chicago Law School. He clerked for Supreme Court Chief Justice John Roberts and he has received awards from the Conservative Federalist Society. And his co-author, Professor Michael Stokes Paulson, a constitutional scholar at St. Thomas School of Law. He also worked previously as a federal prosecutor and at the Department of Justice Office of Legal Counsel. He's listed on the Federalist Society's website as a legal contributor. These are conservative professors, academicians, and constitutional scholars. So Professors Bowd and Paulson authored a lengthy law review article, 126 pages long. Full disclosure, I read most of it, but not all of it. But here are some of the top line takeaways from their analysis of Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. First of all, they say that the disqualification clause in the 14th Amendment is self-executing, operating as an immediate disqualification from office without the need for any additional action by Congress. And they go on to say, without the need for any court cases to be brought, no lawsuit needs to be brought, no criminal prosecution to be brought. It is self 
executing and it is automatic. And that makes some sense. Think about this. Each state sets its own rules and procedures and, and they have their own laws for how a name can be put on the state ballot in a presidential race, in a presidential election year. Many states have the Secretary of State involved in that decision, you know, uh, discharging that duty. If somebody comes to a Secretary of State in one of those states and fills out the appropriate paperwork and says, I'm 34 years old and I want you to put my name on the presidential ballot in this state. What does the Secretary of State say? No, you're disqualified. The Constitution says you have to be 35. There is no new law that has to be passed. There is no court challenge that has to be filed, neither a civil suit nor a criminal case. Why? Because the Constitution disqualifies that person. The same holds true for someone who engaged in insurrection or gave aid and comfort to those who did after that person took an oath to support the Constitution. They are automatically disqualified. No act of Congress, no act of a state legislature is necessary. No court challenge, no civil suit, no criminal prosecution is necessary because the Constitution disqualifies them. So the next logical question is, how is that implemented? How does it actually work? Well, the authors of this law review article state clearly, directly, it, the disqualification, it can and should be enforced by every official, state or federal, who judges qualifications. And friends, that's what we were just talking about. Let's use Michigan, for example. The Michigan Secretary of State is Jocelyn Benson, and I believe under the Michigan law and the Michigan procedures for putting names on ballots, it is largely her decision. She is the one who exercises the power, the authority, and the discretion to decide what names can properly be put on the presidential ballot in Michigan. So if somebody comes to her who is 34 years old and wants to get his or her name on the presidential ballot, she would refuse to put it on. She would exercise her authority and decline to put that name on a presidential ballot because that person is disqualified under the Constitution. The same is true if someone who previously took an oath to support the Constitution but thereafter engaged in or gave aid and comfort to an insurrection. That person is disqualified by the Constitution from having his name placed on the ballot for president. I'll tell you, friends, if it was me and I was a secretary of state or an election official or the person who was empowered, who was authorized to either place names or decline to place names on a presidential ballot in my state, you can bet I am not violating the Constitution by putting a 34-year-old on there or putting Donald Trump on there because each of those people is equally disqualified. Now you may say, well, what happens when some Secretary of State decides to put Trump's name on the ballot or declines to put Trump's name on the ballot? Well, then I think that's when there are court challenges that will undoubtedly be filed. And I say, bring them on. In the states where somebody puts Trump's name on the ballot, there will be lawsuits filed saying this violates the federal constitution because the evidence that Donald Trump engaged in or gave aid and comfort to an insurrection is clear. It's on video. We've seen it with our own eyes. We heard what he said with our own ears. In the states where they refuse to put Donald Trump on the ballot because he engaged in an insurrection, 
um, a suit will be brought, undoubtedly, saying, oh, no, 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 his name has to go on the ballot. And all of these things will move into the courts, and I believe the courts will, by and large, get the litigation right. I'm going to talk in a future video about how I see this playing out once it bubbles all the way up to the Supreme Court, but take heart, spoiler alert, I think the Supreme Court is going to get this right, and they will support the conclusion and the interpretation of the Constitution that says Donald Trump is disqualified from holding federal office again, but we'll talk more about that in the future. But for right now, I would say if it were up to me, if I had the authority, given the the power and the scope of the office I held, if I were, for example, a Secretary of State, I would not violate the Constitution by putting Donald Trump's name on a presidential ballot. I wouldn't do it, and I would welcome a legal challenge because I would be doing what is right, what is just, what is fair, what is constitutional by keeping his name off the ballot just as sure as I would keep a 34-year-old off the ballot. Let me finish up with the conclusion by Professors Bowd and Paulson. They say, Section 3 of the 14th Amendment disqualifies former President Donald Trump and potentially many others because of their participation in the attempted overthrow of the 2020 presidential election. And following the Constitution and disqualifying Donald Trump from holding office again, like justice, matters. Friends, take heart. We are headed in the right direction on many fronts, and we're going to get there to a better place. As always, please stay safe, please stay tuned. And I look forward to talking with you all again tomorrow.